Good morning. Let's all stand together and join and sing a couple of hymns this morning. Good morning. We're glad to have you here in this worship service with us this morning. We hope that you're blessed by the time that you spend with us here in the service this morning. We hope the Lord speaks to you both through spoken word and through song. 
If you're visiting with us this morning, we're especially glad to have you. We would ask that if you would, there's a card in the back of your pew. If you would fill that out and just put it in the little church building that's on the back table so that we could have a record of your attendance, we would that would be much appreciated. All right, we're going to have a special music shared with you this morning by Miss Rachel Orr. Rachel is... Yeah, she's making her way up, but we are always blessed when she takes the opportunity to share with us this morning. This is especially especially uh, good for her this morning to be able to do that with Josiah being home, so she wanted the opportunity to share this song. I think this is one of his favorite songs, so we hope that you're all blessed as she shares this special with you this morning. Good morning, everyone. God's Word says that His Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. But then Jesus came to earth and he made it personal. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when we take our time with Jesus and his word, that's our personal time with him. He bids me go to the world of woe, his name proclaim forever, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. Hey! 
Amen. Thank you, Miss Rachel. And certainly it is good to have Josiah home for a couple of weeks. The Ward family, they just kind of have a, a glow around them this morning. Have you noticed that? Uh, but we are so grateful for Josiah. Josiah, thank you so much for serving our country and and uh, being, amen, amen. <clears throat> well, it is good to see everybody. I just want to second what Jeff's already said. Thank you so much for coming and for all of our guests. It is a, it is a true honor to have you with us this morning as we worship King Jesus together as the body of believers. And um, we're going to continue in worship by going to God's Word. And so I'm going to invite you to stand as uh, we continue in our reading of the book of 2 Thessalonians. And so we pick up in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 13. The Bible says, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by, or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort, and God, hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. What a great word for the people of God. Well, this morning, before we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to mention two things that I would like for us to pray this morning about. Um, many of you, he's kind of hard to, to forget, but many of you remember Brother Ronnie Spillers. Remember Brother Ronnie Spillers? Um, Brother Ronnie is in need of open heart surgery, and he's been facing some obstacles due to insurance. Imagine that. Um, but he really needs this surgery, and so there's been some anxiety and that sort of thing. And so I'd like for us to pray for Brother Ronnie Spillers. And then the second thing that I want to, to mention to the church family is kind of a, it's a bittersweet thing. Today, uh, we are excited for Cariana. Many of you know Cariana. Uh, is uh, we we've seen her grow up. She's uh, where is she hiding? She's up there in the in the uh, in the loft up there. Um, but we have we have over the years seen Cariana coming as a child and then up through the up through the uh, youth. She always has a beautiful smile on her face. And today is a is a sad day because today is her. Well, it's not going to be her last day, but for a while it's her last day because she's heading off to college. She's going up to Carrollton, to the University of West Georgia, and we are so proud of her, but certainly we are sad to see her leave, but I want us to pray uh, for Cariana as she steps into the next chapter of her life, and no doubt God has great plans for her. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for that glorious truth that Rachel just sang about, that you go with us, you walk with us. We are never alone as your children. And today, Father, we come to you just praising you, thanking you for allowing us to come and worship you, allowing us to have that personal relationship with you. You're not some far off God, but you are near to us through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. And, and we are so grateful for that. And I thank you for each and every one who is here today. We give you our burdens. We give you our concerns. Lord, I pray above all for those who might be here as religious people, but they've never met Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would give them ears to hear and eyes to see what only you can enable them to see, and that is their need for Jesus Christ. And I pray that today they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. For those of us who are saved, O oh Lord, give us a hunger and thirst for you. Help us to be faithful to you. That is ultimately our calling, just to be faithful to you as we seek to go out into a lost and dying world and make disciples. Lord, I thank you for your church. I thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, this morning we want to pray for Brother Ronnie Spillers as he's walking in a difficult season. He needs the surgery, and we, we pray, O oh Lord Jesus, for your will to be accomplished in this, and as he walks this this difficult road, Lord, help him to cast his concerns and his anxieties on you. And we know that you tell us when we keep our eyes stayed on Jesus, you will give us perfect peace. And so I pray that for Brother Ronnie. And then, Lord, we're so thankful for Cariana. Lord, over the years, we've seen her grow, and we're so, so blessed. We are, we are the better for 
uh, Kariana's attendance here at First Baptist Church. And, and Lord, we, we thank you for, for her and we're excited for her as she goes off to college. And we just pray, Lord, that as she steps into this new chapter in her life, that these will be some, some abundant and fruitful days for her as she goes to get her college degree. But even more importantly, Lord, we pray that this would be a time in her life that she draws even closer to you, bring some good godly Christian friends into her life, protect her, Lord. We know that we're in a spiritual battle, and so, Lord, we pray for a hedge of protection around Cariana. Lord, we commit the service over to you. We pray that everything that is done, said, sung in this place will bring honor and glory to your great name because you and you alone are worthy of all praise, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, every week in an effort to uh, choose songs in the service, I, I make every effort to, to follow the Lord's leading and making those choices. And, and it's always it's always humbling when He takes the opportunity to, to reassure me and, and validate the choices that I make for the service of for the service of each Sunday. And He speaks to me throughout the week in that regard. And, um, it, it's always it's always special. And I think Brother Michael would agree. There are times that and we don't we don't communicate weekly on a weekly basis in regard to what He's preaching versus what we're saying, but there's been times when we both looked at each other at the end of the service and said, you know, that was, that was, that was the Lord's word right there. The Amen. Word the and, and the message. And, you know, this week was kind of the same way with me, and especially in this season I'm going through in my life where I'm trying to wonder if I made the right decision or wondering what the next step's going to be and, and those sort of things. And, and I felt led this week to to um, have the theme or, or sing about the, the love and the goodness of God. And, and the hymns are a perfect example. Like, and for you, those of you, the men that didn't have the opportunity to attend the breakfast yesterday morning, you're missing a great opportunity. We'd ask that you come and, and join us each, each Saturday morning or each uh, once a month on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, the first Saturday morning of each month. We'd ask that you'd come and join us. But the Lord validated that again for me yesterday morning. I had actually chosen the songs, The Love of God, and, and Brother Mark spoke on the depth of the love of God yesterday. And, and, and even this morning, as, as I did my devotion this morning uh, and 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 the, the verses that I read this morning, I'm going to have Rachel share those with you uh, in just a few minutes. But it's just it's just humbling to me and, and how the God, how the Lord validates the choices that I make, and even the choices that we make. When we make choices based on His leading, it's always humbling and and and, and gives us the opportunity to rejoice when we see that He works through those choices. So Rachel, if you would share those choices with us. Psalm 37, 23 through 27. The footsteps of a man are established by God, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because God is the one who sustains his hand. I was young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his seed begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his seed is a blessing. Depart from evil and do good, so you will dwell forever. I love you, Lord, though your mercies never fail me, all my days I've been held.
may be seated. their way to Children's Church and as they uh, go I want to invite everybody else to turn in the book of Mark. We're, we're studying through Mark and so we're in Mark chapter 10 and we're going to be looking at verses 46 through 52. Mark chapter 10 verses 46 through 52. That song was a blessing to me. Every time I sing that song it's a blessing. You know God is a good God and um, but here's the reality of it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but most of us as believers, how do we, how do we come to know uh, that God is a good God? Typically, it's not when things are going great, right? It's when we're suffering. It's when we're going through affliction. In fact, the psalmist said, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Why? Because it was in that affliction that, that the, the, the writer came to know God in a more deeper, intimate level. And that is true of us as believers uh, when we go through hardship. That's when we're more in tune to God and, and we see by experience that He is a good God. All right, so we're in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. I want to start out by simply reading the text. This, by the way, is, um, I, I think it's my favorite story in, in the Gospels. It's such a beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, story, so just forgive me if I get a little excited, uh, but I just can't help it because this is such a this is such a wonderful story. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, "Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me." And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped said, and said to him, or said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Father, we thank you for your word. It is truth. We thank you that you open the eyes of the blind. And so, Lord, open our eyes so that we can see you more deeper, more fuller today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading a really interesting story this week and involved a man uh, simply the, the article just gave his initials his initials are TN he, he was from uh, Switzerland and several years ago this man had two strokes one on each side of the brain and so the strokes severely damaged the part of his brain responsible for vision his eyes were perfectly healthy but he was completely blind he could not see objects that were put right in front of his his face well he was he he went under a lot of different tests and, and the doctors decided to to do an experiment with this man and so one day they they put the man in a hallway and they put everyday objects kind of setting them up randomly as obstacles in the, uh, the hallways, there was trash cans and stacks of books and stuff like that. However, they didn't tell the man that they had put anything in the hallway. They just simply asked him to walk down the hallway. And amazingly, as the man walked down the hallway, something happened. Instead of stumbling into the obstacles that were, were placed out in the, the hallway, um, he was able to carefully step around each of the, the, the obstacles, never touching one of them. It's been discovered that TN has what is known as blind sight. Blind sight is when a person is unable to visually see objects, but somehow part of their their brain allows them to subconsciously see and perceive 
objects and their locations. So you could say that these people, they're blind, but yet they can see. Today, I want to talk about another man who was blind, but yet he could see. Many of us are familiar with this man. His name is Bartimaeus. Many of you grew up in Sunday school or going to vacation Bible school and you were, you, you were taught this story. This, this blind man, this, this healing is the last healing mi- uh, miracle recorded in Mark's gospel. It comes right after, if you were here last week, it comes right after Jesus' lesson on true greatness. There we learn that in the kingdom of God, true greatness is demonstrated By being a servant. Mark chapter 10 verse 45. It's kind of like the the key verse that summarizes the entire chapter or the entire book of Mark. For the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so here we see right after that verse Jesus demonstrating servanthood. Jesus is, is just a few weeks out from giving his life on the cross, so he's on his way to Jerusalem where he's going to suffer and die for sin. He is is fixed on getting to to Jerusalem. He He is concentrated. He is very focused. But despite this suffering that is looming on the horizon, Jesus shows compassion. He He shows love as he serves this blind man who was suffering. So here's Jesus. He's he's heading to to suffer, but on his way he takes time to show compassion to a man who was suffering. Now, before Bartimaeus comes to to meet Jesus, we, we know the text tells us that he was completely blind. He couldn't see he couldn't see anything. But after he meets Jesus, his sight is perfectly restored. But don't miss this very important lesson. Not only was he given a new set of physical eyes, but through faith, he also was given a new set of spiritual eyes. Now this is kind of ironic when we study the story of Bartimaeus because Bartimaeus, while blind, he was able to see most things, or or he was able to see things that most people in his day could not see. For example, the rich young ruler that we studied a couple weeks ago about. He he wanted heaven, but he could not see that the only way for him to have heaven was for him to be saved. The religious leaders, certainly they they prided themselves in their religious devotion, but that they were spiritually blind and they were lost. The Son of God was right in, in, in their very midst, but they were completely blind to it. Matthew chapter 15, describing the, the religious leaders, said they are blind leaders of the blind. And even the disciples at times demonstrated that they struggled with uh, spiritual blindness. You know, this is true even today. There's people all around us that have perfect vision, 2020 vision, but yet they're spiritually blind. They, they can't see what is, what is obvious, spiritually speaking. They can't see what matters the most, what is most important. The, the world is certainly full of spiritual blindness. Sadly, we were reminded of this recently with the Olympics. Why do you have uh, people who mock our Lord in such a shameful, disgusting way? Spiritual blindness. They they don't see how precious Jesus Christ is. It's in the world all over, but yet, sadly, you find spiritual blindness even in the church. A lot of people in the church are, are religious, good moral people but yet they don't have spiritual sight. Now, that's, that's very frightening. That's a sobering thought that you can be in church. 
can be raised in church. You can come to church faithfully, but yet be spiritually blind and not be able to see what is most important. And from today's story, we learn that those who have been touched by His grace are able to see things that the natural man can't see. So today, we're going to go for an eye exam. We're going to get our eyes checked to see if we have been given this new set of eyes. And in order to do this, I want us to look at blind Bartimaeus, and we're going to note four things, four things that Bartimaeus was able to see that most people of his day were not able to see. Bartimaeus was a blind man, but he certainly was not the only blind person on that day. So first of all, in verse 46, what was this blind man able to see? Well, he was able to see his pitiful condition. He was able to see that he was helpless and he was hopeless. Note verse 46 again. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Barnabas, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. His name is Bartimaeus. Very few times is when there is a healing miracle that there is the actual name of the individual given. Sometimes you have uh, family members that are named, you know, uh, but, but this man is actually named. Now we speculate, but it very well could be that the reason why Bartimaeus is named is because he goes on to be a very influential, well-known member of, of, the, of the early church. So Mark is, is giving Bartimaeus' personal testimony, if you will. And here he is. He's sitting as a blind beggar. He is in Jericho. Jericho being about 15 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Many Jews would travel through uh, this area on their way to Jerusalem as they would be going to observe the Passover. So this was a great place for beggars. Bartimaeus was not the only beggar there that day. There's a lot of traffic. Um, you, you get a lot of exposure. And so if you're, if you're poor and destitute, you go to places where there's lots of people. And so here is Bartimaeus along with many other beggars. He's sitting there on the side of the road. Now that's important to, to remember that detail. He's sitting on the side of the road. Now, some of you like to throw little curveballs at me every now and then and you'll come up to me after the sermon and you'll say but preacher in Matthew's account it says there's two beggars there was two blind men there was, was Matthew and Mark were they not on the same page is there a contradiction in the Bible no this just adds to the to the the truth that God is is, is working through people to write his word you got individual accounts here of course Mark would have not been there on that day, but he gets his information from Peter, who was. Mark and Luke mentioned, mentioned only one blind man, but Matthew mentions two, or uh, yeah, two. Again, possibly Mark is just focusing on Bartimaeus because he was so well known, or maybe he was the loudest, the most outspoken of, of the two men. But he's in a pitiful condition. He's blind. We don't know why or for how long. Was this from from birth, or did this happen to him as a child? We, we don't know. Blindness was certainly a very common thing in Jesus' day. The thing about blindness, like many illnesses during this time, blindness carried a stigmatism. Many people saw blindness as you were under the curse of God, that you had some kind of sin in your, your life. Thus, in John chapter 9, verse 2, it's recorded that his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? That was another blind man. But the point is, is that the people are looking at that blind man on that particular day, and they were saying, you know, what is, is he blind because he sinned or his, his parents sinned? And the point is this, that there was a stigmatism. If you were blind, like leprosy, then God's hand of judgment was, was upon you. He's blind, he's poor, it's bad enough to be poor, but, but he had nothing to help himself. There was no disability insurance. He was reduced to being a poor beggar at the mercy of the multitudes. Now there's a problem there if you're at the, 
if you're at the mercy of the multitude, uh, most of the multitude scorn these type of people because, again, he is accursed by God. And, and, and so people would just ignore most people. Every now and then you would get somebody who may throw a, a coin or, or two. So here's Barnabas. He was blind, but yet he's able to see his pitiful condition. He was able to see that he was helpless and he was hopeless. Now, do you see the picture here that Bartimaeus paints of all humanity in regards to our pitiful condition and our natural state? Before we come to Christ, lost humanity are spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. Paul said, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this world has blinded, who do not believe. And then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, as the Apostle John was, was uh, writing the very words of the Holy Spirit, Jesus addresses the church at Laodicea, and the Lord says to those at that, at that church, that church was predominantly made up of lost people, he says this, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Before we came to Christ, we were spiritually blind. We couldn't see the obvious. We couldn't see what was most important. We were blind to the reality of sin. Blind to the reality of coming judgment. Blind to the gospel message. You can talk to a, uh, a lost person and you can tell them the gospel and if the Holy Spirit is not working in their life, it just goes right over their head. They don't have the spiritual lenses to see spiritual truth. And thus they don't see the beauty of Christ. Christ is not precious to lost people because they don't see him for who he truly is. Before salvation we were spiritually blind, but also as we look at Bartimaeus we're reminded that before salvation not only are we spiritually blind, but we are spiritually poor. To use biblical language, the lost men and women and boys and girls are spiritually bankrupt. Now, I know the world likes to paint a picture of humanity that we are all wonderful, wonderful people, but we're not. Now, I know that that doesn't get a whole lot of amens. But that's what God's Word says, that before Christ, we are wretched sinners. We don't have anything of worth to offer God that, that in any way merits his mercy, his forgiveness, his salvation. Paul reminds us of this, this important truth in Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 12 where Paul says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. Profitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. One, spiritually bankrupt. And the only ones, listen church, the only ones who will inherit the riches of heaven are those who are willing to first see and acknowledge their spiritual poverty. So the first thing that this blind man was able to see was he was able to see his pitiful condition. Number two, in verses 47 through 48, what was the second thing that he was able to see? He he saw his only hope. He saw his only hope. Yes, he saw his pitiful condition. He saw that in and of himself he was hopeless, he was helpless, but with the eyes of faith, Bartimaeus was able to see his only hope had just come his way. And what was that only hope? That was Jesus. Now God's grace here is obviously at work in Bartimaeus' heart. I mean, Bartimaeus didn't wake up one day and conjure up faith in and of himself. He's been touched by the hand of God. He's been touched by grace, and his faith demonstrated that. What kind of faith did he have? Well, he, he showed a desperate faith. That's there in verse 47. So here he is. Just get this in your mind. Here's, here's Bartimaeus. He's He's sitting on the, the roadside. He's, he's calling out, asking somebody, can you, can you spare a, a coin?
coin? Would you, would you have mercy? Give me something. But then verse 47 says, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Luke's account, in Luke chapter 18, verses 36 through 37, says that, that he heard the multitude who were passing by, and there, there's a lot of commotion. They're talking about this one who is coming, and, and he says, what is all the commotion about? And they responded and they said to him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. But for Bartimaeus, Jesus was not just this unknown man from an unknown village called Nazareth. He's the son of God. He is the son of David. The son of David was a, a popular messianic title. You're not just nobody from Nazareth. You are the promised Messiah. He was a pitiful, poor man, but his faith, again, allowed him to see what the religious couldn't see, that Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one. Perhaps this, this man had, had heard what the prophets of, of old had predicted about the coming Messiah. In fact, in in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5, Isaiah spells out some of the, some of the signs that would accompany the coming Messiah. And, and he said this, again, Isaiah 35, verse 5, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. <laughs> and there's, there's blind Bartimaeus, and he couldn't see the actual miracles that Jesus had performed with his physical eyes. But perhaps as he was sitting there day after day along that roadside, he was hearing people talk about this man named Jesus who was performing miracles. And so while he couldn't see the miracles with his physical eyes, he saw with, with spiritual eyes, with eyes of faith. And so here is his hope. His only hope. And he cries out. Now, we don't get this in the English, but in the Greek, we're informed that he doesn't just cry out one time. He's crying out over and over and over, have mercy on me. I am, I am desperate for your mercy. Son of David, have pity on me. He's not coming entitled. He doesn't have an entitlement mentality. He's not demanding his, his rights. He's not saying, I deserve it. But instead, the, the heart of this, of this man was, I have no rights to your mercy. I have no right to claim it. But I am totally desperate. Please have mercy on me he has a desperate faith but something else we learn about this man's faith verse 48 he had a determined faith when you get to that place where you realize that jesus is your only hope nothing will stop you from getting to jesus you don't cry out to jesus he's trying his best to get jesus's attention you know what it's like you're in a big crowd of people or maybe you're in a really busy restaurant and it's really loud and you're trying to get somebody's attention. You, you see a friend or, or, or somebody across the room and you begin to cry out to them and they don't hear you. Here's Jesus. There's Bartimaeus. He's hearing that Jesus is somewhere near. And so he's, he's crying out with this determination to get Jesus' attention. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, we, we've seen examples of of people with this kind of faith, a determined faith to, to get to Jesus because they were they, they, they saw him, just like Bartimaeus, through eyes of faith as being their only hope. You remember the Syrophoenician woman in chapter 7? She had a, a daughter who was possessed by a demon, and, and she was determined to get just a crumb of mercy from Jesus. Jarius in chapter 5, whose daughter had died, he was desperate. He was determined 
to get Jesus' attention. The woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years, she was desperate and she was determined. Bartimaeus was determined. He's not going to let any kind of obstacles get in his way of getting Jesus' attention. He's not going to let people keep him from getting Jesus' attention. It says the crowd, they begin to hear this poor, wretched beggar. You don't have time for you. You're just a wretch. Shut up! Hush! That's what they were saying. But the more the crowd tried to silence him, the louder he got. He refused to let these people block him from getting to Jesus. He's not going to let pride keep him from getting Jesus' attention. He didn't care what people thought. Remember, there was a Pharisee one time named Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus by night under the cover of darkness. Not, not Bartimaeus. This is, this is in the middle of the day. He didn't care what people think. He didn't care what people said because those people, they couldn't fix his problem. But Jesus could. Don't you ever let a person keep you from Jesus. You could say that Bartimaeus, uh, he was at the right place at the right time. And that was no coincidence. This was planned before the world was even formed. Jesus was his only hope, and Jesus is our only hope as well. Jesus, church, is our only hope. Are you hearing me? But you know what? You will never see this until you first are willing to let go of your religiosity, willing to let go of your supposed morality, and recognize and admit that you are helpless and hopeless on your own, this is why the religious leaders, they rejected Jesus because they were blind to the problem. They didn't see that they had a problem. Everybody else were poor, wretched sinners, but yet them. And so therefore they hated Jesus because Jesus told them what was true about them and they did not like it. Alistair Begg once said, you will never know Jesus as a reality in your life until you see him as a necessity in your life. No, Jesus is not some kind of add-on to add to all the things that you can offer to God. He is our only hope. Without Him, we are nothing. So, this man, he saw his, his pitiful condition. He saw his only hope. But in verses 49 through 51, he saw something else. He saw his one chance. He saw his one chance. Now, I like this. Verse 49 and Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. Remember what, what is on Jesus' mind? The cross. Jerusalem. His eyes were fixed like a flint on Jerusalem. He had a mission to fulfill. But yet he stops. He stops... Why does he stop? Because this man's face got his attention. And he stops and, and he tells probably his disciples, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He, he's, he's calling you. You know what Jesus is calling you? Take heart. That's, that's good news. Jesus on his mission, going to Jerusalem, but yet he was willing to stop for this poor man. Jesus had time for Bartimaeus. And guess what, church? Jesus has time for you. Notice what Bartimaeus does, verse 50. He, he jumps up, and the text says that he, he throws his cloak to the side, and he goes to Jesus. Now, unlike the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler, he comes to Jesus. He says, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And at the end, Jesus says, you go sell everything that you have and give to the poor, 
and come follow me. And the rich young ruler went away grieved because he had many possessions. The rich young ruler refused to surrender his many possessions, but yet this man surrendered his one possession, the only thing that he owned, in order to come to Jesus. And that was his cloak. We don't get this because we're so far removed from this culture, but a cloak was very important for a poor beggar for two reasons. Number one, this was your only source of income, especially if you're a blind man. Because if you're a blind man, you can't see the man who's coming that's got a pocket full of money. You you simply call out and you plead for people to have mercy, and if there is any who is who is merciful enough, who may be willing to pitch you a coin, they didn't put it in the person's hand, they just threw it on the cloak. The cloak caught your money. And maybe, I I seem to believe that on that day, there were already some, some coins on that cloak. And what did he do? He throws it off to the side. His cloak was his only source of protection at night. It provided comfort. From the, from the cold. But Bartimaeus recognized that this was his, his one and only chance. Jesus, more likely not going to come that way again. And so he takes advantage of the opportunity. He gets to Jesus as quickly as he could. And Jesus asked him a question. What do you want me to do for you? Now, does that question sound familiar? It should, because that's what he asked his disciples last week. He asked the same thing. He asked his disciples, what do you want me to do for you? Give us honor. Give us those places, those those seats that that are seated right next to you in your your kingdom. He says says to Barnabas, the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? Now, was Jesus just kind of slow? I mean, did Jesus not understand what this man needed? Well, of course he did. But you know what this teaches us? Jesus... He, he, he wants us, he wants us to publicly articulate what we need from him. And Bartimaeus says, let me receive my sight. He doesn't say, Jesus, give me a bunch of money, give me wealth, give me honor, but simply, let me receive my sight. So he saw his one chance, and finally in verse 52, This is beautiful. He saw his new identity. This blind man saw his his new identity. Not only was Bartimaeus given a new set of eyes, but he's given a new identity. Verse 52, going back to to the text. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Don't miss the miracle. He gets a new set of physical eyes, but he's given a new set of spiritual eyes. He's a new person, a completely new person. That that word made you well in the Greek is sozo, that's for salvation. So yeah, this man was healed physically, but he experiences salvation. He was converted, as we may say, And how was he converted? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. And Bartimaeus was eternally changed. Danny Aiken said, grace is the divine hand that extends healing. Faith is the human hand that reaches out and receives it. And notice, notice, this this is good. Notice how Bartimaeus reacts, immediately recovered his sight, and followed him on the way. He, he doesn't, now that he's got new eyes, no telling how long he'd been blind, he doesn't say, okay, I got what I want from Jesus now. I'm going to go sightseeing. I'm going to go see things I hadn't seen in years or maybe had never seen. But instead, he made a life-changing decision to what? To follow Jesus. Again, he sees that he's no longer a blind beggar sitting on the side of the road But verse 52 says that he's now a disciple of Christ committed to following him on the road. You see that? We started the text off, Bartimaeus is on the side of the road. He's an outsider, he's an outcast. Now that grace has touched his heart, 
He's converted. He has a new identity. He's now a follower on the road. And you know, Bartimaeus, maybe another reason why his name is actually mentioned is because he provides such an important lesson for us. That, that the mark of a true Christian, one who has truly experienced grace, who has truly been regenerated in the heart, not their emotions tickled, but the truth that one is truly born again, the mark of a true believer is, is that true Christians follow Jesus. Because being a disciple is our new identity. To say that you're a Christian, but yet you're not a follower of Jesus, is absolutely foreign to the Bible. So what could this blind man see? Well, he saw his pitiful condition. He saw his only hope. He saw his one chance. And praise God, he saw his new identity. So this text in the way of application. I think there's, there's two questions that we're forced to ask ourselves. Remember, I told you we're going for an eye exam. So number one, ask yourself this question. Can I see what is most important? Can I see what is most important? Do, do I see who I am outside of Christ? That if all I have is church membership, if all I have is religion, if all I have is trying to do better in my life, I am hopeless and helpless. Do you see that this morning? Can you see what you need this morning? If you're a hopeless, helpless sinner, which you are, do you see that you need mercy? You need grace. You and I, we need forgiveness. That's our greatest need. Do you see that today? Do you see who you need? Do you today recognize that Jesus Christ is your only hope of salvation? Again, it's not religion. It's not your baptism. It's Christ. Do you desperately every day recognize how much you need Jesus Christ? Sometimes, personally, I, I, I get a little nervous when somebody shares their testimony and Jesus is never part of their testimony. That's concerning. Because the only hope of salvation, the only hope of eternal life is Jesus Christ. And we don't, need, we don't always, not only need Him at the moment of salvation, but church, we need Jesus every single day because without His daily mercy and grace, we're going to wander off like a bunch of stupid sheep. Do you see that? And do you see this morning why you have been saved? You have been saved to be a follower, to be a learner, to be a disciple of Christ. So number one, can I see what is most important? Number two, will I stop to help? Will I stop to help? Will I stop to listen to those who are hurting? Do, do I have time in my... I always laugh when people say, well, how you doing? So often I say, oh, I'm busy. Really? Join the crowd. How many of you in this room are busy? And we're all... Go ahead and raise both hands. We're all busy. And it's so easy to allow busyness to blind us to the needs of others. Will you stop to listen to those who are hurting? They may not be looking for all your answers, because most of us, we don't have the answers. But just simply listening to somebody. And, and by the way, when somebody is sharing with you, let it be about them. Don't stop and say, oh, let me tell you. <laughs> that ain't nothing compared to what I've been through. I've met people like that. I've been one of those people from time to time. Just listen. God gave you two ears, one mouth. Just listen. Will I stop to help those who are in need? Will I stop? Am I willing to stop and pray for those who are struggling? Will I stop to share with those who are lost? They need to hear the good news. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how shall they hear 
unless they have somebody who would tell them. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we, we thank you for this beautiful story today. I look forward to that day when as the family of faith will gather together and we'll be able to meet blind Bartimaeus. What a beautiful testimony of grace, love, compassion, saving faith. May we heed the words that we've been given today and I pray, Holy Spirit, as only you can, would you apply your truth to our hearts as you see fit? If we're lost today, we can't see spiritually. We're, we're living in, in total darkness. We don't even realize it. And so, Lord, I pray that there's lost people here today. Open their eyes. Help them to see their desperate, pitiful condition. But, oh, Lord, help them to see that there is hope in Christ and Christ alone. And I pray that they would run to you in desperate faith, clinging to you for salvation, clinging to you for pity and mercy. No, oh Lord, as saved people, we've, we've had our eyes open, but maybe there's some things in our life that we need you to do for us. Maybe there's some areas of blindness in our life. Lord, we're all in the process of growing. None of us have arrived. We still have lots to learn about how amazing of a God you are. Open our eyes to a deeper, fuller understanding of the greatness of God. Lord, thank you for speaking to us today, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to stand as we have our hymn of invitation this morning. This is a, this is a limited opportunity. Bartimaeus, I think he had an inclination, but little did he know that Jesus would never come his way again. This may be the last day that Jesus comes by your pew, your way. I think he's asking all of us, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you today? Maybe today it's the day of salvation for you. You need to be saved. You don't have that confident assurance that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You don't have that confident assurance that you have a home in heaven when you die. But you can when you leave. If that's you, you come forward. And we'll help you in your understanding of, of salvation. Maybe you're saved. Your eyes have been opened. But you need Jesus to help you. Maybe there's a situation in your life. Maybe you're facing something. You know what? We all face struggles in life. They're too big for us to handle. But His grace is sufficient. And when we call upon Him, He has time for us. So you do whatever God is leading you to do as we sing hymn number 513, the nail scarred hand. Have you failed in your plan of your storms or slight? Place your hand in the nail scarred hand. Are you weary and worn from its torn? Your dearest friend. 
dearest friend, place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. All right, be sure that you get a copy of the uh, bulletin. There are several things that you want to uh, be sure that you take note of. I, I do want to highlight just a couple things. Next week, next Sunday... Um, I want to offer a new members class. That's just a class that uh, helps if you're maybe sensing that God is leading you to become an actual member of First Baptist Church. Opportunity for you to ask questions, give you information about the church as you seek God's direction in that. So that is next Sunday morning. We will start at 9.15 right upstairs in the uh, choir room. If you don't know where that's at, because you're... You're new around here. That's, uh, we don't expect you to know where it's at. So you just come to the Welcome Center and we will show you. Um, but uh, I just want to make that available to you again. That's next Sunday morning. Deacons, we have our, our deacons meeting at 4 p.m. Choir, you will be practicing at 5 p.m. Wednesday night, we start Wednesday night. Supper's are back. And I'm so excited because we are fed well. Amen. Yeah, everybody. See, I'm not the only one excited, Brother Mike. Uh, but listen, do me a favor. If you want to eat, be sure you put your name on the list. And I've, I, I made it easy for you. It's right back there in the back on a clipboard. We want to have enough food, so be sure you sign up before you um, leave. Miss Bethany, you have an announcement as Bethany is coming. Men, we need you. Let me tell you how we can use you. On Sunday mornings at 845, every Sunday morning in the choir room, we get together as men, and we poured our hearts out to the Lord over various needs. We pray, and I want to extend that invita invitation to every one of you men. Come out, join us. Great time of fellowship, but even more important, it's a great time of, uh, of prayer. Next Sunday afternoon, Adam, set at 4 p.m. in the fellowship hall, children and youth committee. You will have a meeting. All right, with that, Bethany, give us your announcement. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, the great thing about salvation and being a follower of Christ, he didn't call us to go at it alone. He called us to do it in community. And this is another way for you ladies to do that. So if you have any questions, see Bethany and she will give you all the information you need. All right. Brother Jeff Braswell is our deacon of the week. Brother Jeff, would you mind closing us in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you as your people for the opportunity to be given spiritual sight, Father, to see 
the lostness of the world. Father, we just ask that you would now give us the strength as, we be, as we're able to see, that you'd give us the strength to go out and share and, and care and, and share the gospel with that world, Father, as we leave this place. Father, we pray now that uh, as we take this offering that you would take it and use it to multiply and, and further your kingdom. Father, we pray that you would go with us throughout this week, that you would watch over us, protect us, lead us, guide us, and direct us in all the things that we do. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.